Good afternoon and welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. My name is Josh Harrison. I'm the president of Improving and a member of CMC Board of Trustees. We are, we are so pleased you are all with us today. Before we begin, a very important thank you, very important thank yous uh, to our sponsors today, the Columbus Partnership and The Ohio State University. Let's give them a round of applause. Also, a thank you to the Center for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation and the Columbus Dispatch for presenting today's live stream. Thank you. Um, let's give a round of applause for everyone that I just mentioned. <laughs> at today's forum, we'll learn about nationwide origin story and why it matters today. You can thank Ohio's, Ohio farmers, you can thank Ohio farmers for the beginnings of one of the state's largest business and one of Columbus's top philanthropic supporters. Nationwide insurance was created in 1926 by the Ohio Farm Bureau to help farmers insure their vehicles. Today we'll hear from the leaders of the Ohio Farm Bureau and Nationwide as they share perspectives on Ohio's economic future and the power of lasting partnerships in a changing world. To introduce today's speakers, please welcome Kenny McDonald, President and CEO of the Columbus Partnership. Kenny, the floor is yours. Thank you, Josh. Uh, first of all, thank you to CMC for hosting us today and for the work you do throughout the year. Uh, Jane, you, you know we love you. 50 uh, great meetings this year. Kudos to you and your entire team. <clears throat> um, as Josh said, I'm President and CEO of the Columbus Partnership, a collection of over 75 CEOs of our major employers uh, and civic institutions uh, that are here to ensure the economic uh, uh, security and future of our 11 county region. And it's great to be uh, here introducing two great partners, one from the private sector, uh, Kurt Walker and uh, Adam, who is our partner across our 11 counties. Over 40% of our region is agricultural, uh, one of our most important industries, and there's no better partner than the Farm Bureau uh, for that work. One of our core beliefs is that great companies make great communities, and that the opposite of that is also true. A great community makes a great company. CMC is one of those things that helps to make the community better through debate, conversation. And I want to thank again uh, the CMC for this forum. If there's ever been an outstanding example of that relationship in action, it's what Nationwide has meant to Central Ohio uh, and all the other communities they operate around the country. Uh, but obviously we have a special relationship here in Columbus and the surrounding area. They've provided not only economic opportunity for our residents through jobs, uh, but they've enriched the community around us and made it a better place to be, to recruit to, uh, and to have our kids and our grandkids work in the future. There is no more intentional company uh, as a nonprofit leader when you get a board member from Nationwide, they're all in. Uh, and it's both instructive for the other people that sit on those boards, uh, but is a recognition that uh, they're very thoughtful about how they engage in the community. Not only by giving dollars, which is no small amount of money across this community, but also through their care, engagement, the volunteerism they do throughout the region. Um, they're just an outstanding example of what a cor corporate citizen looks like. They're a model community partner and employer in our region. The nationwide region story is one that uh, couldn't be better match for the partnership. Uh, Kurt was named our uh, co-chair of our organization just yesterday. I want to thank Kurt for his additional leadership um, and someone who grew up on a farm himself. Maybe we'll hear a little bit more about the good old days today or maybe not through some stories, Kurt. Uh, 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 but I know that you can appreciate the importance of agriculture in our community and Nationwide certainly does uh, that, which is something that we hear about more and more on this panel today. Um, finally, as someone who also grew up on a ranch, I can tell you that uh, there's a few numbers posted on your refrigerator. Uh, one is your Farm Bureau agent, and uh, uh, you always know your insurance agent. You got a lot of equipment, you got a lot of vehicles, and something's always happening. Uh, so you gotta have that number close at hand. So I appreciate everything that you do. Uh, finally, uh, I wanna thank Colleen Marshall for always anchoring and giving of her services. Um, Please welcome Adam Sharp, Executive Vice President of the Ohio Farm Bureau Federation, and Kurt Walker, Chief Executive Officer of Nationwide, of course, our host, Colleen Marshall. Colleen. Thank you so much. 
first of all, I think, I think in this day and age, the history of the Farm Bureau nationwide is known to everyone in nationwide and at the Farm Bureau. But I think there are a lot of people who are shocked, startled by the way nationwide started and why it started. So Adam, I'm, I'm going to start with you. And tell me a little bit about how Ohio farmers first formed the Farm Bureau. So uh, humble beginnings, right? And you know, we look right out the window at the at the nationwide towers over there, and uh, and, and that's where our office is still located today. The Ohio Farm Bureau is in the nationwide complex, and you go back to those humble beginnings in the in the 1900s, early 1900s, and uh, you had a number of farmers uh, coming together here in Ohio and across the country. They were forming uh, farm bureaus in, in various states, uh, and here in Ohio, we got together at a building, Jennings Hall. Uh, Jennings Hall at Ohio State University, so just south of the main library. So if you're on Neal Avenue there, heading south from the Oval, uh, you'll see a plaque there, and it's in front of the building. And Ohio State doesn't put up many historical plaques, but there's, there's one there that signifies that that's where, uh, in 1919, January, there was a signature signed, and it formed the Ohio Farm Bureau. Uh, and that was, that was helped created by Ohio State uh, Extension Service and their work reaching out to farmers and working with farmers to innovate, to do research, to try to find the latest best practices in 1919. That was, that was a big deal. Then working cooperatively, farmers wanted to come together to advocate for rural Ohio, for communities, not just rural communities, but for communities in food production. Uh, also, for legislative efforts, but also for things like social issues and education. These were all important uh, to, to farmers at that time frame, and it was very important for them to put together uh, an organization called ultimately the Ohio Farm Bureau in 1919, which led then to a few short years later, 1926, the creation of Nationwide. And I, Kurt, I'm going to ask you to pick up the story there because it's very different to have this very practical farm community to suddenly a services community. So how did that come about that uh, an insurance company was born? You know, it's interesting. Um, I'll pick up on two of the words that Adam has shared already. And he talked about collaboration and he talked about cooperation and more specifically the cooperative movement. So you think about the mid 20s and there was a group of farmers in rural Ohio that said, we don't think it's fair Right? We don't think it's fair that people in rural Ohio pay the same um, amount of premiums for auto insurance as people in you know, Cleveland or Cincinnati or Columbus. So they got together and with a $10,000 loan from the Ohio Farm Bureau, um, Ohio Farm Bureau Auto Insurance Company was born. So uh, we issued our first policy in April of 1926. And uh, later that year, we had our first claim and uh, we have our 100 year anniversary coming up, so we've been spending more time kind of going through the archives. Steve Hosfeld, who's our uh, historian, is here with us today. And we know that uh, the first claim we ever paid was in 1926 to Russell Fox. He had a theft from his auto. Someone stole an inner tube, a tire, and a rim, and we paid him $25 for it. <laughs> Here's what we love about it, the fact. He wrote us a letter afterwards and said, it was incredible. I received my money within 24 hours of my claim being submitted. Today, we would label that extraordinary care. So yeah. <laughs> the other thing I would offer is, Adam, we have paid the $10,000 back that yeah. you loaned us back in 1926. I appreciate that. But, uh, um, and I think if, if you think about who Nationwide is, people say, well, you know, are you a uh, um, property casualty company? Or are you a financial services company? Um, last year, we did about $53 billion in revenue. About $33 billion actually came from financial services. The other part came from property casualty. People often think about us as an auto insurance company, right? That's where our foundings were, and you see a lot of our advertising. But the reality, we're not a property casualty company. We're not a financial services company. We're a protection company. And if you think about the mission, right, and that's what we love about Farm Bureau and, and Nationwide, we're both mission driven. So what's our mission? Nine simple words. We exist, right, to protect people, businesses, and futures with extraordinary care. And we added coverages, we added other products as we determined that people, especially in rural Ohio, 
had additional needs. So that's where it started, and that's where we're at today. With so much in financial services, define for us what financial services looks like for Nationwide. Yeah, so if you think about the makeup of the financial services, uh, life insurance, uh, we believe this year will probably be the uh, number five producer of uh, um, new life insurance in the United States. It's a protection product. Annuities, right, as we see pensions going away in the world, we know that there are people that want what their grandparents, what their parents had, I just want a planned income uh, in retirement. Uh, retirement plans, we do 401ks. I think everybody knows about that. Uh, we're the largest provider of 457 programs in the United States. Well, what does that mean? A government 401k type programs. And then we have our own mutual funds company as well. But one of the things that was a milestone this year, I love fun factoids, you're probably figuring that out. <laughs> um, earlier this year, our pet insurance company we're largest provider of pet insurance uh, in the United States, went over our one millionth uh, um, four-legged friend insured. So it'll be a billion dollar business for us la next year. And here's my fun factoid, Colleen. Our first customer 40 years ago in our pet company was the original Lassie, so. Oh, wow, that is a good factoid. Yeah. yeah. And if I remember correctly, the original Lassie was actually a male. So there was gender fluidity you were covering back there. I, I'm not touching that. <laughs> Adam, uh, I know a little bit about farms. My sister lives on uh, several hundred acres farm in Western Pennsylvania, where I'm from. And the one thing that always surprises me is the amount of money they have to spend on equipment. Yes. And we're talking about farmers, oh, we need to get our car insurance. It's nothing compared to the investment that farmers have to make. And, and when you look at the typical farm, you have the farmhouse, the outbuildings, the tractors, the land, the, maybe the livestock. It's a massive undertaking today, isn't it, when you talk about farmers and what they invest and what they need to insure? It's one of the big reasons why uh, Farm Bureau and Nationwide, right, th why the company was created, uh, uh, because of the risk management with all that investment. It's huge, right? It's a big investment. And if you go back, it's kind of interesting. There was a story of, uh, and I'll, I'll throw the name out there, because Kurt or I, it, it's a requirement. We, we've got to mention Murray Lincoln. Okay, we've got to mention Murray Lincoln. Um, so if folks don't know the name Murray Lincoln, you should, you should read about him. He's got some terrific books that he wrote, uh, either about him and, and one, one he wrote himself, another one's written about him. A real innovator here. He was our founder. He was our first executive vice president of the Ohio Farm Bureau, and then he was the first CEO of Nationwide. So he, he helped start Farm Bureau and then start Nationwide. And he was big in the cooperative movement internationally and, and from here. And, uh, and he, he was a good discussion of him talking about the beginnings of Nationwide. And he said, you know, in the boardroom, this was a boardroom discussion. And he said, you know, cars, automobiles are no longer a luxury. They're now becoming a necessity. And, uh, you know, and, and that was like 1925 is yeah. when he was having his conversations right before the founding of Nationwide. Um, and he talked about the cost and the risk right? and, and, and this big investment for these, for these vehicles that were now becoming so important. Uh, to, to moving food, right, around our country, moving food to our grocery stores and moving food to our families, right? It's a big deal. Um, so it, it, it's fascinating that you, you, you raise that question, right? You look at those original costs and risks, and that was a, that's a big part of farming. Was from 1919, still is today, um, even more so today. Um, it's one of the reasons why we've stayed partners, you know, and, and, and we will continue to stay partners. We've been partners now for 100 years. We'll probably be partners for 100 more. I and, agree. And that's a, a big reason, is there's so much risk in farming, uh, there's so much cost, um, but it is, at the end of the day, it's the necessity, right? Without agriculture, without our farms, our farmers, and our food, where would we be, right? Where would we be? We can't build the rest of our industry. Um, so it's a big deal. Um, it's a big deal. It's a big part of who we are. It's a big part of the business model that we work with with Nationwide, those business services to be able to ensure that risk. And, and, and if you think about, uh, uh, again, Murray Lincoln, I mean, he was out in front of Steve Jobs by a number of years, yeah. right? Just so thoughtful and so innovative, and I know we'll talk a little bit more about that, but one of the things that he talked to us about was the fact that uh, we can do more together than what we can do alone. And he also had this accountability attitude that said, you hold your future in your own hands. 
And I believe that's more true today or needs to be more true today. And if you think about our relationship with the Ohio Farm Bureau, we're member uh, oriented. We get feedback from the people across the street uh, when we're doing a good job and sometimes when we could be even more productive. That's how partnerships work. That's how the cooperative movement works. And uh, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you. Another hundred years. We should get together in another hundred years and do this kind of thing. So, yeah, that'd be good. I may still be on the air then. It's been a long time. Uh, so let me ask you this. You're talking about partnerships in this relationship. Is this a financial joining? Do you still, do you, does the Farm Bureau have a financial stake in Nationwide and vice versa? What kind of a partnership? Yeah, so business solutions. Uh, so whether it's financial and insurance in both of those spaces, uh, yeah, we work very closely together. Uh, Nationwide is our exclusive uh, provider for insurance for our members. Um, so if you're a Farm Bureau member, um, then you get access uh, into the, to all those, those services that are, that are offered through Nationwide. And like I said, and those are changing and growing all the time. Um, a big part of agriculture, of course, is change. And you know, we're always, modern agriculture right, is so different than it was even 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Um, and, and you have to keep innovating and, and figuring out new ways to handle risk and to manage businesses. Um, Kurt was just talking about these at our annual meeting last week. Um, and there's these various different new technologies that Nationwide brings in uh, to, the, to, the, to the barns, to the equipment, uh, to help manage risk, to help control for fire suppression, to help monitor our haystacks for heat and moisture and whether or not you have a risk building in your barn. Uh, a series of different things, new tools all the time uh, that are being introduced into the marketplace uh, for farmers to use uh, to make sure that we don't destabilize our food system, right? We, we need to ma manage this risk wherever they are kind of across that food chain, um, and they do that. Nationwide also provides a lot of different uh, uh, business services and products to agriculture. So on the farm, but also across agriculture, across ag businesses and food businesses, the entire food chain, I think that's important to mention as well. And, and again, it's part of our heritage, but we're a company that does things right, but we also do the right things. And if you think about member services, we're the largest provider of agriculture in the United States, right? So we ensure more farms and more cooperatives than anyone in the United States. So if you think about who your partners are, who you should collaborate with, who your ultimate customers are, in many cases, it's farmers across the United States just not limited to Ohio. We have eight other relationships similar to what Ohio with Farm Bureaus. We have other groups that we call sponsor organizations. And I think one of the greatest values we get is we bring those people together several times a year and we ask for feedback. And one of the things we remind ourselves before those meetings is feedback's a gift. So we receive gift, we take that away, and we try to do better things for our ultimate members, which is, which is one of the beauties of being privately held, being a mutual. We can play the long ball, right? We can plan longer down the road. And the other partnership that always comes into play, I mean, you think about it. I don't know that anybody planned this out perfectly, but it has worked that way. Ohio State, Ohio Farm Bureau, Nationwide, we're all in a stone's throw here. So some of the things that we're doing at Waterman Farms, at the campus of Ohio State, it's not about what's going on today. It's planning for the future. And so some of the innovation that's taken place out there with Dean Kress, I mean, the world is changing so much. Everybody in here might recall a time that you had a grandparent or an uncle or maybe a parent that uh, um, made their living off a farm. That has decreased immensely, right? So the farms and agriculture have gotten larger and larger and larger, and food security has become even more popular. My wife and I drive by our favorite billboard that says, if you ate today, thank a farmer. And part of what takes place is sometimes in America today, people think that food comes from a grocery store. And it does, but the farmers you know, developed and grew before, before it got there. And that's part of what we want to continue to tell. Food security in America is a big deal. Innovation in ag and farm is a key part of our partnership along with Dean Kress at Ohio State. You, you mentioned that you've moved, obviously, beyond Ohio. It's easy to see how this relationship could grow and flourish. You're right here together with an interest in the same community. But how did Nationwide get a foothold outside of Ohio? So from, from our standpoint, um, 
We just wanted to be able to spread our risk, right? If you think about what we do, we're a risk manager. And as we looked at the customers that we served, at one point we looked up and said, you know, it's, it's more than just Ohio. And we started to make a move more towards the east than what we did the west coast. And as we looked up and said, we need to spread the risk, we need to provide more services to the group that uh, founded us, then we started to make more of a movement to the west. And again, in each one of those areas, we said, what other products do you need? What other protection do you need? And that's how we grew to the extent that we have. So uh, we're not done yet. Um, a number of our board members are here this week, and they would like to see us continue to expand and grow. So. I had to get that in because I have a review right. coming up later this year. <laughs> <laughs> you, you also touched on uh, there aren't as many f small family farms anymore. Uh, where my sister lives, she's probably a rarity that they still have. This is a farm that's been in her husband's family for generations. But when we look at developments like what's happening out around New Albany and the land there that suddenly becomes so attractive to farmers and farmers who may not have children who want to stay in the family business, how do we, how do we protect the land that we all rely on here in Ohio that's still the number one industry in Ohio? How do we keep farms as farms? Wow, I, I, I could have slipped that's, her a couple bucks yeah, for the question. That's a good that question. Probably, yeah, so, that's yeah. an easy question. <laughs> it's actually a very easy question, keep farms strong. If, if the farm economy is working, you will have farms. If, if we're making sure we're supporting agricultural production in this country and in Ohio, which we do a very good job here, um, then you're gonna have farming families. You're gonna have farms. And you know, 96% of the farms uh, in, in Ohio and also in the country are family-owned farms. They just still are. It, there's, there's some misnomer out there. Uh, but the reality is, is that the vast majority of the farms are still family-owned farms. Some have gotten very much bigger. Some have gotten very specialized. In Ohio, it's an interesting statistic that in the last, if you look at USDA's data the last couple times around, um, we've actually increased the number of small farms and large farms in Ohio. Um, so you're seeing a specialization, and Ohio is kind of unique in this regard. When you got a city like Columbus with all the dynamic growth that you talked about, Cincinnati, Cleveland, all of the other uh, mid-sized cities around the state, you have a unique opportunity, more so here than in a lot of other states, where you have a lot of farm families and farming businesses encircling, right, and are part of all these communities. So a lot of direct marketing opportunities. Several of my board members are here too, um, and they directly sell a lot of times to new markets directly into urban and suburban markets because there's more opportunities to do that in a state where you have such an uh, intermix of, of communities uh, that are urban, suburban, and rural. Um, so that, it's an opportunity, and we're, we're seeing that type of growth here in Ohio. And, and I also think that, uh, point well made, you know, how many times do you go back to maybe a metropolitan area you haven't been to for a while, and it's expanded so much? And, and people will say, I used to ride my pony through the farmland that was here. And now it looks like we're raising vinyl siding, right? And that's just reality throughout the United States. So part of the reason the partnership we have with the Ohio State is so uh, important is safe, secure agriculture. But we've got to be even more innovative, right? There was a time that uh, I can remember in the 60s that, wow, if the corn was knee high by the 4th of July, it was going to be a great harvest, right? People got 50 bushel of the acre. I mean, we have farmers who got close to 400 bushel of the acre. So um, the world's gotten larger from a population standpoint. Land that's available has gotten smaller. It's more important that we be innovative. And the other thing, from a protection standpoint, and this is where I was like, I didn't ask you to um, poise this question. Um, that was one of the things that came from our sponsors. And they said, we have this issue. And a number of years ago, we developed a program called Land is Your Legacy. Right. So what we wanted to do is to be able to get families together before the patriarch or the matriarch left and say, what is your plans for the future of your farm and your agriculture? Um, probably a lot of people in here know of farm families who have had issues, right, arguments about uh, the future of the farm. We put a program together so farm families can come together and plan today allow the farm to speak about what its wishes are um, so you can plan for the future on things. So again, cooperative, collaborative environment. Uh, any idea how many farmers, the percentage of farmers in the U.S. that use nationwide services? 
Well, I would tell you this, in the state of California, which is the largest uh, um, agriculture environment uh, in the United States, we insure about 54% of the farms. Yeah. So, Who's your uh, biggest um, competitor? Uh, it depends on the area that you'd be located in. So as a national, we compete with a lot of regional uh, um, folks, so you'd have to ask by state almost. But uh, um, there's some great, great farm-based companies out there but uh, the scale that we have is typically puts us far in front of them. So Adam, you, you both mentioned this relationship with Ohio State University. Yeah. How does that work for, for, how is this like triumvirate working? Yeah, I, I, Kurt mentioned innovation, and I think that's a great way probably to start to describe that, that piece. There's so many different ways that we're connected with Ohio State in between Nationwide, Farm Bureau and Ohio State. But if you, if you jump way back again, since we're talking origin stories, you know, Ohio has a remarkable history of agricultural innovation that has impacted the country. Not just Ohio, but the country. So, and some of those very strong original directions are with Ohio State. For example, 4-H. Everybody heard of 4-H? A lot of 4-H'ers in the room? 4-H'ers in the room? A lot of you guys, myself, my kids just, just graduated out of the 4-H program. Um, 4-H was started in Clark County, Ohio. Uh, a lot of folks don't realize that, nationally and internationally. Five million kids a year, but they started here. It started with A.B. Graham getting together 20 boys and girls in a courthouse over in Clark County and talking about uh, how to identify wildlife and, and grow a garden. And, and it went from there to, to 4-H, international. Uh, the FFA jacket, the iconic blue FFA jacket um, that every FFA wears, 50,000 of them a year. Fredericktown, Ohio, put that together. Uh, the cooperative movement, uh, the first rural electric uh, telephone pole was set in Piqua, Ohio, for the whole country, the first time uh, after they passed Rural Electrification Act in the 30s. The first pole ever set was in Piqua, Ohio. So Ohio agriculture, and then, and then of course now we have the largest, uh, you know, the largest agriculture insurer in the country. So a lot of innovation, a lot of history there. A lot of connections of this through Ohio State. Whether it's research, whether it's supporting young people, our biggest probably relationship and interest with Ohio State, yes, the research is great, the innovation is terrific, but it's getting young people a pathway into careers in food and agriculture. And uh, I'll just share this real quick. It was uh, last week we put, a, we put a young man in front of our annual meeting, uh, 700 people, and we asked him to talk uh, a little bit about his experience. And, and he's 17. Uh, Jaden lives over by uh, uh, Linden, over here by the State Fair. He grew up in that community right there next to the State Fair. And, uh, and he said his first experience ever with, with farming or food nag was he went over to the State Fair and he went in the Land and Living Building. Well, the Land and Living Building is a partnership between ourselves, Nationwide, and Ohio State. And, uh, and he said, that was my first experience with food and ag and where my food comes from. And he was very excited. He went into our Explore Ag program this last summer uh, at 17. The Explore Ag program is something that we work together on as well, all three groups. We host, it's basically a glorified college visit. It happens over at Ohio State campus. Um, and, we, and, and young people can be there, high school kids can be there for a week and learn about career paths in agriculture. Well, he, he wanted to sign up to go to main campus. And he, and he went on and he found out that, that that course was already full. So he signed up and went to Worcester, to ATI. And he told us last week, he said, that was my first time to the country. <laughs> <laughs> my first time to the country. And he said, you know, I spent more time that one week outdoors than he had the last two years because of COVID disruptions in his school and the different disruptions he had. He goes, I spent more time outdoors that, that week than I had in two years. And he goes, I wanna be a food science major. And then he shared with us his goal, of course. His goal was to make a gummy bear that is nutritionally value enough that you can have it and have all the nutrition you need while you're gaming. So we thought that was a pretty, we thought that was a pretty cool goal of his, pretty cool goal. Yeah, so, that's, that, that is a really. Yeah, but, but that's, that's what our connection, that's the heart and soul of our connection with Ohio State uh, and, and our partnership with Nationwide is young people pathways into food and agriculture. And I imagine you have your specific partnerships with Ohio State as well. Absolutely. And so if you think about some of the um, work that's taken place with the Risk Management Institute that we help to fund, if you're not aware, we have a unique program called Telematics, where we actually uh, can pro provide lower insurance prices to better drivers. So Ohio State and the risk management work that we've done there as well. And a lot of this is, if you haven't found this in my comments so far, 
we're becoming more proactive versus reactive, right? If you think about what protection is, being more proactive. So we have a couple of different programs. Anyone who has someone who's a young driver or about to start driving, we have a Smart Miles program where mom and dad can actually monitor their uh, um, you know, use, uh, use of the vehicle, whether they're accelerating too much, late night, escapades, some of those kind of things. I'd mentioned earlier, coaching and feedback is really important at Nationwide. Uh, this allow parents to give coaching and feedback. And what we want people to do is to be able to provide coaching and feedback before a tragedy takes place, right? And uh, that alone with uh, um, some of the other things that we do, we think is going to make a real, real dif difference. So, You weren't always known as nationwide, though. At the beginning, you were at this farm partnership. Yeah. So why, where did that name come from, and why did you switch over? So the original name in the 1926 was the Ohio Farm Bureau Auto Association. And that was our name, basically, uh, uh, the Ohio Farm Bureau Insurance Company. And then in the 50s, there was a transition that took place. And some of that was regulation, right? The fact that uh, the powers that be at the time said, eh, we really don't like the Ohio Farm Bureau on an insurance company. And uh, that's when we said, you know what? That's fine. We can part ways and become nationwide, but we'll always have that relationship. And it's Pretty cool to think that was in the 50s, and I think our partnership has never been stronger. Yep. So, yep. Nationwide also is known, uh, and, and we've touched on it here, that when you're on the board, when you have someone from Nationwide on the board, it's a boost uh, in support, in money, in recognition, and other people saying, oh, this board matters. So what's behind the philanthropy, and how do you decide when there are so many worthy causes where Nationwide will put its efforts? Well, it was, it was interesting. Uh, Chad Jester, who's the president of the Nationwide Foundation, is with us today. And I noticed that he was a lot more popular than any other Nationwider as we started to gather <laughs> out here. And uh, um, we get that. We get that. So uh, in the year of 2022, when the final checks are written, uh, Chad will have written checks that equate to about $43 million into the areas that we work and, and live in. And it's hard. Chad gets hundreds of millions of dollars worth of requests, but he's got a group that goes through and determine, you know, what's the best thing for the um, areas that we operate in. We over-index in our giving, right? And, and how are we able to do that? We're a private, we're a mutual insurance company, we can play the long ball, and we take our mission really, really serious. It's just not about insurance and financial services products. Is there a way that we can offer protection in the communities that we live and work in? So I think, you know, a little bit of fun with Chad there, best job in the whole world. It's tough to be able to determine when you get hundreds of millions of dollars worth of request and you have $40 million to spend. So. Great job, Chad, and uh, yeah, we get it. That's why people like to be able to tell us their story, and we appreciate that. Well, I think farmers were appreciated more than ever when we were going through the pandemic, and we realized uh, how, you know, not just the toilet paper shortage, but <laughs> how important it is to be able to get to a grocery store. We all take that for granted. We had supply chain issues. We had resource issues. We had people who didn't have money. By the way, today is double your donation day at NBC4 for the Mid-Ohio Food Collective. I want to get that plug in. Even though I don't have a board, I feel really jealous that I don't have a board in the room. But, but do you think that, that the awareness of the importance of agriculture and farmers was heightened over the last few years? Yeah. Yeah, I'll throw out my... I'll start this off, I'll throw out my Murray Lincoln quote, right? And, and Kurt referenced it a few minutes ago because it's very fitting in this context. And uh, Murray's probably most uh, uh, favorite quote that everybody likes to mention is, he said, people have within their own hands the tools to fashion their own destiny. People have within their own hands the tools to fashion their own destiny. So that was his most famous quote. And that became really, really evident you know, just a couple years ago. Uh, because here in America, right, we're not used to going to the grocery store and suddenly it's empty, right? There's big, there's big pieces that are empty. And uh, we work closely with our partners like Kroger, for example, who's here you know, to make sure that the, the food was gonna be there. It wasn't that there was a shortage. 
but there were definitely spots within the system. Uh, milk processing, for example, meat processing, those two places in particular, we had significant disruption uh, because of COVID disruptions. Sometimes that was just the supply chain and moving things. Sometimes it was truly people, people were sick. They weren't there. They couldn't come to work. Um, so those two places became really evident um, that there was, there was real challenges. So looking at that experience, Right now is an exciting time to be in agriculture. It's an exciting time. There's a lot of challenges out there, but it's an exciting time because the innovation that's coming out of that, we talk about the repositioning of the global food system right now, and, and, that's, and it's very real. Um, the repositioning of the global food system. And what does that mean? Well, um, it means we're taking a hard look at those supply chains. We're taking a hard look at what does it mean to make sure that we have uh, food security in this country. Because if you don't have food security, you're going to have food insecurity real quick. Um, so what are we making sure that we're doing to be innovative to address the things we just learned about coming through a, a pandemic? Making sure we're supporting uh, the agriculture and our food chain, and making sure we're we're also advancing the industry. I, I'll, I'll share this little story to wrap that piece up with. Is when you talk about innovation in agriculture, we had we had a, a young man who came over to our board meeting um, this fall, and, and he talked about he and his brother and their family farm, and he talked about the innovations they're putting in place on their farm to make sure that they can continue to produce six robots. Two robots to milk the cows, okay? This is a 100 cow dairy, not very big dairy these, these days, 100 cow dairy. Two robots to milk the cows, okay? So the cows are coming in, he's just hearing it on his phone. He's watching on the phone. The cows come in when they wanna be milked and they get milked. Uh, cows know when they need to be milked, by the way. So they, they do, they come in, they go through. Two more robots that grind the feed and place the feed through the barn, okay? So there's, there's two more robots moving the feed around. Two more robots cleaning up the manure in the barn. We call those uh, manure rumbas. Uh, but the manure rumbas, they never stop. So they run 24 7. So, so, and he's monitoring all this on his phone. He's monitoring all this on his phone. So that's the era we're in. So when we're sitting over here looking at a pandemic disrupt the food system and, and spaces on the shelf are empty, and then you look at the technology and the innovation we have going on in the industry, it's a very exciting time to deal with these challenges. It's, it's a good time to deal with some of these challenges and to move the industry forward. So yeah, it's a great question. And, and my hope and belief is that people had enough time to reflect on things, and I hope that they did reflect. So here's my own personal story. Jeff Sellers, our uh, board chair is here today. Can you imagine making this conversation, right? So it's March 18th, 2020. And I have to pick the phone up and call my boss and say, uh, I'm, I'm gonna send everybody home over the next four days. Oh, who are you sending home? Uh, everybody? Well, like how many? 28,000? We had that ability, right? So we had planned for catastrophes for over a dozen years. We'd never planned for a global pandemic, but we kind of put all the plans together and we sent people home over four days, 28,000 people home over four days. That worked for us, we were prepared for it. You cannot send farmers home to work, right? They've gotta be out there with the agriculture that uh, they make their living off of. And if you think about uh, you know, the workers in uh, um, food services and the Kroger's and the other places out there, those people had to come to work every day so we could eat. And you think about the food processors, right? People stand in shoulder to shoulder during the hardest times of the pandemic you know, cutting up protein so we could eat. Uh, never had a failure in that space. And it's just absolutely incredible. And, and I hope and believe that people took more appreciation away from people that had to be there and you know, basically put their lives on the line to be able to feed America. So. I want to remind you that we are going to be moving in a moment now to asking your questions. Jane's getting some questions from people online. So if you have a question you would like, you can line up over there. Very quick story, number of years ago, I was working with a photographer who grew up and went to college in Chicago, had never lived anywhere but Chicago, came here to work, we were driving through some farmland and there was a big hog in a pen right by the street and he slammed on the brakes and he said, what is that? <laughs> and I said, you mean that hog? And he said, tell me the truth, baby, do we eat that? <laughs> So the reality is a lot of people do not understand farming 
it's important. So my quick final question to each of you, how important is outreach and, and do we need to care that people don't understand farming? Yeah, it's, it's critical, right? It's critical. I, I'm glad you asked that. You know, there, there's a great old Teddy Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt quote where he talks about, and I, and I have it here, so I have it here, this is great. So we were founded as a nation of farmers in spite of the great growth of our industrial life it still remains true that the whole system rests upon the farm. The whole system rests upon the farm. And that is as true as it was when he said it in 1914 as it is right now. It's as true as he said it. So it, I think it's critical. Um, and I think the pandemic probably highlighted that more so the, to, to people recently than it ever has been before. Um, but it's very critical. I, 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 you know, Kurt mentioned, get that phone call, right? And, and you're going to send all these folks home and try to figure that out. I, I remember when uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor Husted called me and said, hey, Adam, we better talk, we better talk about making sure we can continue to feed people. Um, uh, when, when the pandemic was starting is, what do we need to do to put in place to make sure that our food system is, is going to be exempt in enough ways that we can keep moving food from the field production to the consumer in Ohio on those first, those first week of the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's a phone call I never expected to get in my life, right? Well, and, and but a think, very important one. I think yeah. it drives the reason that we're so connected, Ohio State, nationwide, um, and the Ohio Farm Bureau, innovation and technology. And if you think about the work that's just underway at the Ag Tech program at Waterman Farms, it's about safe, secure food. And I think that there have been people who actually believe and they're passionate. They might have been in the car with you that, you know, farmers are out there and they mistreat animals and that, you know, they do bad things to the food that we eat that's grown in fields. Um, farmers have always been stewards of the farmland. I would offer that most farmers would say, I don't actually own it. I just nurture it for a generation then pass it on. And I hope that's one of the many things that comes from the ag tech work that we're doing at Waterman Farms is to educate people, right. you know, kids that have never been to the country and someone who doesn't know that, you know, that's a hog. Um, those seem to be real basic, but there are more and more people in the world that don't get that because their grandparents didn't have a farm, their uncle didn't have a farm, they didn't grow up on a farm, and we're losing that. And that's part of the partnership and innovation taking place yeah. at Ohio State. Colleen, you mentioned, you mentioned the hog. You know, probably the most popular thing that happens in our building at the state fair, in our land and living building, is we, we put a couple hogs in there. <laughs> and, and, and they're pregnant, and they have their babies during the fair. And last year, it just so happened that the, that the one hog was giving birth right before we were getting ready to close the building that night. And we could not get people out of that building. Man, they wanted to stay and watch. <laughs> and these are folks who knew nothing. You know, they've never seen a hog before. And they were just absolutely fascinated, in my opinion. That's, that, that's right. You know, we, we just got to have more of that interaction. Absolutely. We're going to go to Jane now for the first question. Well, I have some questions. Thank you. That was excellent. I have some questions online. And then anyone who has a question, please come up and we'll take turns. So. Um, one of the questions is picking up on what you were talking about with such a small percentage of folks in the United States still in production agriculture. Um, there seems to be a wave of criticism of agriculture. You know, all we hear is factory farms and they're doing horrible things to our water and horrible things to their livestock. How, how does agriculture and how does nationwide um, change that perspective and, and help consumers understand that the farmers are the stewards of the land. And, and I think that's the difference between Nationwide and other insurance companies. You know, we live the mission, we value partnerships, and I think much of what we do is education, right? Much of what we do isn't tangible. Uh, it's about telling the truth and, and believing the truth. And, you know, I, I tell you who's done an incredible job in that space is Ohio Farm Bureau. and. Uh, yeah, I think uh, it's the easiest way uh, to dispel so many myths about modern farming and agriculture is just talk to a farmer. Just go talk to an actual real farmer and ask the questions, and they'll tell you. They'll talk to you. And not only will they do that, they love having you out and showing and telling. Um, there is, there is no, no folks more proud uh, than, than farmers of what they do, and they love to show it off. 
they'll show you the latest technology that they just spent a quarter million dollars on to place fertilizer better into the ground so it doesn't run off. And they will show you then the data behind it, and they'll show you the satellite imagery that allows them to drive that equipment to do that placement of the fertilizer so it doesn't run off. You know, so those are the kind of things that uh, uh, farmers enjoy doing. The innovation part is a huge part of that. Uh, but just ask a farmer. Actually, there's a number of them in the room here today. <laughs> so, you know, and, and if you don't know a farmer, let us know. We're happy to connect you to some. Uh, we spend a lot of time making sure uh, that folks can come out and, and interact with agriculture uh, and farming, uh, whether that's at the state fair, whether that's at the Farm Science Review over here, whether that's at COSI over here and farm days in the summertime, you name it. Uh, we, we, we spend a lot of time working with our friends at Ohio State and others about just that outreach. But please reach out to us because we would love to talk more about any of these issues that people ever have a concern about, and, and especially some of the very fun innovation happening in Ohio uh, around those challenges. Sir, if you could introduce yourself and tell us your question. Okay, Doug Buchanan with Columbus Business First. You mentioned at the beginning of the pandemic sending all of your employees home. I think there are a lot of downtown backers who would like you to see them bring them all back. Uh, what is the status of that? Yeah, so uh, um, we were blessed. We had planning. Um, we'd made a habit out of the fact that we always ask people to take their laptops home with them every night because we're a risk management company. If something bad happened, uh, we wanted to be prepared. So uh, in April of last year, well, let's go back to when the pandemic started. And what we did is we got together as a management team and said, let's make this really, really simple. What's the problem that we're trying to solve? And what we said is, look to our mission, right? Those nine simple words, right? We protect people, futures, businesses with extraordinary care. All right, let's talk about the environment that we're in. How can we best do that? And we said the best way that we could do that, Doug, would be to collaborate with our uh, um, associates and to be able to have them feel safe. Remember what it was like early on? We really had no idea what was going on. We said, you know, we're going to nurture, we're going to take care of our associates, we'll send them home, we'll allow them to work from home. And we did that, and what we discovered was, by the way, uh, at that time, we had 5,200 people that permanently worked from home. So the 25,000 people that we had, 5,000 of them were working from home. This was not new to us, and we'd done this for years. So we knew it could work, and we knew we had the right people, the right attitude, and the right uh, uh, perspective on things. So um, yeah, we'd actually made that movement. Uh, everybody went you know, safely to home that could. We had some people that had to stay in the office. Today, if you think about the breakout, about 50% of the people are, are still working in their homes. Why? Because that's the best way for us to accomplish our mission. We've got about 10% of the people that come into the office every single day, and the remainder of the people are in some kind of a hybrid environment, right? Might come in Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, we've had the new normal. We have the now normal. And in the future, we'll have the next normal. And what does the next normal look like? Um, you know, I think it ends up being probably more of a hybrid environment for all. So uh, at this point, I mean, people have challenged us. Hey, you got all these people working from home. Um, the heck, it's just going to go to heck in a handbasket. Okay? So that was in March of 2020. We sent everyone home. 2021 was the best year in nearly 100 years at Nationwide. We grew over $6 billion. Our engagement is measured by an outside source was better than it had ever been. 38 people engaged to one disengaged, world class is acknowledged by Gallup, uh, and we kept the promises that we made. So uh, I think it just shifts as we move along, Doug, but we think we're accomplishing our mission, and that's why we exist, and we'll see where things go. So great question. Kurt, you mentioned that the Nationwide's uh, strong commitment to philanthropy. What would you tell new businesses or businesses that are moving in, like Intel, and how should they engage in the community, and how would they learn how to engage in the community? Yeah, and, and one of the things that I strongly believe in is the Columbus Way. And Kenny mentioned that uh, Nationwide's been a proud member of the Columbus Partnership for a long, long time. Reach out to people. Ask. You know, the 80, nearly 80 businesses involved in the partnership will willingly willingly share best practices, 
Uh, for some people, I might say, well, we're publicly traded. We can't do those kind of things. All right, we can align you with someone who's publicly traded. We're a startup. We can't give those kind of money. We can align you with a startup. Um, you know, Columbus has all these um, businesses that care so much. Uh, it's all relative. You know, it's, it becomes, and we tell pe people this during our United Way campaign, you know, look to your heart and do what's right for you. And I think that's what I would tell people. But find people that can empathize and share, and I think I would start with the partnership chain. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Yolanda Owens. I am the Partnerships and Pathways Strategist within the College of Food, Agricultural, and Environmental Sciences at OSU. Um, first of all, I just want to thank you both for sharing the history and the relationship between Nationwide and the Ohio Farm Bureau. I'm also often telling that story to folks because surprisingly a lot of folks don't realize the, the relationship. One of the things that I wanted to ask, uh, I'm not sure if a lot of folks in the room know. So one of, there was a piece of research that came out that shared about the folks that are graduating out of land-grant institutions. And right now, when we look at that research and we see that they're graduating only about a little over 60% of the necessary jobs that, that need to be filled to maintain our agricultural sector as it is now. Thinking of that, um, and also thinking about my own path and the fact that I know that I'm an anomaly. I grew up here in Columbus, not on a farm. I'm a product of Columbus City Schools and I still pursued a degree in agriculture, right? Um, but what does it look like or what is the future um, that you all see in engaging people like myself in the agricultural sector so that we can increase the folks in this work, not only because it's the, the number one industry in our state, but also because we need to eat and have clothes and to drive cars, right? Yeah, uh, yeah I'd mentioned something on that. Uh, yeah, Bill Lafayette actually right here with CMC helped us out with that exact study uh, that you mentioned. And it showed that if every kid right now studying agriculture in college graduated and went straight into to agriculture, uh, they would only fill 60% of the jobs that are available in food and ag. So 40% of the jobs would still be open, if you will. So, so there's a, a big opportunity uh, from, from folks from what we'll call either the, the traditional pathway, uh, so maybe you're coming from a farm and you're involved in 4-H and FFA and you find your way into agriculture, or the non-traditional pathway. Uh, so urban, suburban, other, other individuals who have an interest from rural Ohio, who, who, don't, you know, who don't know much about ag. Um, so working to make sure that we have every opportunity for young people to find a place in agriculture and food and ag if they, if they have the interest is great. STEM is a big part of that. It's a big part of what we do. Uh, but also our community partners. I come back to kind of the community partners pieces that Kurt was talking about. Um, I know, for me, one of the vivid memories um, is, is 1991, and a community member standing right in the back of the room back there opened up her winery right downtown here in the brewery district to a bunch of freshmen who are majoring in agriculture communications at Ohio State. And, um, and she took a whole evening from her business to host a group of us, Jane Scott, to talk about her business and to talk about to a group of young college students who, you know, at the time I kept thinking, gosh, this woman has a great business. She's running this, 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 uh, uh, these employees and, and dealing with all the things you got to deal with on a daily basis. And yet she's taking the evening to spend with us. Why, why would she do that? Why would she do that? And, and, you know, and you don't think about those things maybe sometimes when you're young. But taking a few minutes, right? Taking, a, taking the time, if you're part of the industry, to host somebody especially young people, and show them the business and talk to them about it. It's incredibly impactful. Uh, and I think that's how we attract more people in. I mean, I, so hats off, Jane. I mean, I, I'm going to call you out, but, but that, I was one of those kids. You know, I was one of those students, and that was one of my first memories at Ohio State, being exposed to a professional in agriculture. And, and Ohio State connected us with, with Jane. And uh, so I think it's a big deal of connecting people like that very personally. I was personally trying to figure out how old you were as a freshman in this wine cellar. But, uh, I, yeah, don't I, do that math for yeah. Don't I, do that math. I think the other thing that's <laughs> taken place, just as agriculture has changed in the United States, um, entities that have supported agriculture in the past have changed. So I think about 4-H, head, hands, heart, and health. And Mark Bourbon's here. Mark serves as a nationwide uh, president of our property casualty company, serves on the National 4-H Foundation. And people say, well, 4-H is for farm kids. No, 
it's made a shift as well. The number of kids that are involved in urban 4-H and get kind of that first glimmer into the opportunities, agriculture, FFA is similar to that. So yeah, I think find places to get uh, people attached and allow them to make their own decision. Gentlemen, we want to thank you. It's been a wonderful program and we have some final thoughts here. And while the final thoughts were coming up, I wanted to thank uh, Colleen Marshall. So um, this is a big thrill for me to be on the same stage as you because uh, long time listener, first time caller. So this is really cool. Uh, I hope you found today's forum interesting. I know I enjoyed learning about the evolution from Murray Lincoln all the way to pet insurance and manure Roombas, so thank you for that. <laughs> Uh, in all seriousness, it was really great to understand the history of such intentional and purpose-driven organizations and to also understand the future and innovation and where things are going. So it was wonderful. Thank you. Um, I also, one last time, want to thank today's sponsors, the Columbus Partnership and The Ohio State University. Also thank you to our virtual seat patrons and the Center for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation and the Columbus Dispatch for supporting today's live stream. Let's give one more round of applause for all of them. And our special appreciation to today's speakers, Adam Sharp, Kurt Walker, and our host, Colleen Marshall. And I just wanna say it's an honor to close out our final forum of the year and to share the stage with such great leaders. Uh, and I just wanna thank Jane and the team for making this happen all year round. Uh, Looking into next year, please make plans now to attend our next forum, the ever popular Blue Chip Economic Forecast on January 4th. Lastly, our thanks to each of you. We could not do this without you. Have a wonderful holiday season, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.